Welcome to Brookings. My name is Ron Haskins. I co-direct a center here called the Center on Children and Families along with uh, Richard Reeves. Uh, I want to give a special welcome to the co-leaders of this project, Deborah Phillips, whom we'll hear from in just a moment, Mark Lipsy, whom we'll hear from in two moments, uh, and Ken Dodge uh, of Duke. And Ken will head the second panel, and you'll hear from Ken in a few minutes. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the support we received from Heisen Simons, from the Dave and Lucille Packard Foundation, and from SAS. Today we're releasing two reports. One is called a consensus statement on scaled up state and local pre-K programs. Uh, that's the skinny one. Uh, hard copies are available in the back. And the second report is a more elaborate report that Ken assumed leadership of, which deals with a number of issues associated uh, with pre-K and actually with pre uh, early childhood programs in general, such as curriculum, financing, and so forth. And uh, we're going to have two panels, one for the first report. Everybody on the first panel will focus on the first report. Uh, and then uh, the second panel, they'll focus on the second report, and authors of uh, various chapters in that second report uh, will be on the panel. Um, I want to give a special thanks also to Commissioner McQueen from Tennessee, who has agreed to come and talk about the kind of things that we think this, uh, our consensus statements support, uh, and we'll hear a specific example of what one state uh, is doing. And in the case of both panels, the audience will have a chance to add, uh, ask questions, and we encourage questions as opposed to comments, uh, and uh, so you'll get a chance to do that for both panels before we uh, uh, before we adjourn. So Deborah Phillips of Georgetown. Uh, Deborah was more or less the leader of our group. We never actually took a vote, and she will try to share the credit, but actually Deborah held the whole thing together. So Deborah. I think that means I also take the blame, Ron. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, thanks to Dr. Haskins and Brookings for serving as the home for this consensus project, and thanks to the Heising Simons and Packard Foundations for supporting this work. And immense th thanks to the full consensus team, including Dr. Haskins, Dr. Duncan, and Dr. Lipsy, Dr. Dodge, who are here today with me for undertaking the arduous work of forging consensus out of a complex evidence base in a high-stakes context of intense public scrutiny. We came together on behalf of this project with deep, long-standing mutual respect and relationships and a shared commitment to the use of science for public purposes, but also with different disciplinary lenses and different experiences with studying pre-K education that have produced different results. Therein lies both the challenge of reaching consensus and the power of having done so. Why is this statement important and timely? Legislators know that one of the best ways to build a productive and prosperous society is to start early in building children's foundation for learning, health, and positive behavior. With 42 states in the District of Columbia having now introduced and innovated with scaled up state and district funded pre-K programs, it is time to take stock of how well we are doing to optimize the contribution of pre-K education to these societal goals. The authors of this consensus statement are interdisciplinary social scientists who have engaged with local, state, and federal policymakers and practitioners to conduct and translate research about pre-K programs. Together, we are striving to understand the role that pre-K can play in the larger educational enterprise that prepares our future workers, citizens, and parents and how to identify and replicate the most important features of successful pre-K programs in order to optimize this potential. In partnership with Brookings and the sponsorship of the Heising Simons Foundation and the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, we set out to address these pressing challenges so that legislators and educators could reflect on progress to date identify good bet effectiveness factors that may distinguish programs that have produced larger, more enduring impacts from those that have not, and to take constructive action to better meet our country's goals for pre-K education. It should come as no surprise that legislators are eager to maximize learning and skills development. Credible voices, 
from the Business Roundtable to the National Academy of Sciences, are insistent that we will need more people with deeper and more diverse skills, as well as the ability to work in teams if we're to meet the challenges of the future. In response, educators have focused on starting learning earlier, recognizing that early learning builds the foundation upon which all skills development is built. Other countries agree. Most of our allies and competitors have strong early education policies and programs. Scientists agree. If we want a deeper bench, we need to start earlier. An overarching message of our statement based in the developmental and learning sciences is that pre-K is not an end in and of itself. Pre-K does not happen in a vacuum. A child's learning over the course of the pre-K years builds on past development and sets the stage for future learning, which is then affected by children's experiences in kindergarten and beyond. Learning is continuous and cumulative. Effective pre-K education depends on attending to what happens before pre-K, what happens during pre-K, and what happens after pre-K as children enter elementary school. Just as we do not ask what second grade accomplishes in isolation, what happened from first grade and what happens in third grade and fourth grade, or hold this single year accountable for middle school achievement test scores, high school graduation rates, and adult earnings, it is time to re-examine how we consider or situate the pre-K year. The pressing and most useful question today is how can we ensure that we have an effective pre-K through elementary system? Addressing this question is the shared public purpose toward with which this consensus statement is directed. We titled our statement, Puzzling It Out, because identifying the conditions that best promote children's early learning has many pieces. If you look at one piece at a time, one program, one outcome, even one year in a child's life, you run the risk of missing the bigger picture. In order to place our current evidence about pre-K in context, we considered the characteristics of the children walking through the pre-K door, what happens inside pre-K classrooms, and what happens next in the elementary grades. So our report is really about how learning gets charged up and recharged sequentially and cumulatively, starting with what young children bring into their pre-K classrooms, then how pre-K can provide a strong initial charge or boost in early learning, followed by how subsequent educational environments can sustain, deepen, and add or recharge the initial base of skills and knowledge that pre-K has provided. The answer to this question relies substantially on what we know about how young children learn. Developmental science tells us that a key ingredient in effective learning environments is the instructional, social, and emotional serve and return interactions that occur daily between teachers and children as well as among classmates. The odds for better outcomes are improved when these back and forth interactions are consistent, responsive, and stimulating. This brain building interplay motivates and deepens learning enables children to organize and focus their attention and other capacities needed to learn, and promotes peer cooperation and support. What then enables these kinds of interactions? Dr. Duncan will be addressing this question in depth, but to forecast briefly, we offer some good bet targets for next, strength, next stage efforts to further strengthen the nation's existing pre-K programs, focused on ensuring that pre-K teachers are well prepared and supported through professional development and coaching to implement curricula that are proven to foster and deepen critical skills and concepts, and secondly, to provide well-organized, positive classroom environments in which active, engaged learning can occur. So I want to turn to a key finding from the third item in our consensus statements, as it provides a platform for all the others I and my colleagues will enumerate. 
Convincing, I quote, convincing evidence shows that children attending a diverse array of state and school district pre-K programs are more ready for school at the end of their pre-K year than children who do not attend pre-K. Improvements in academic areas such as literacy and numeracy are most common. The smaller number of studies of social, emotional, and self-regulatory development generally show more modest improvements in those areas, end quote. In short, most evaluation studies show that pre-K works. Moreover, many pre-K programs are delivering greater improvements in learning at the end of the pre-K year for children growing up under conditions of economic disadvantage and instability and for dual language learners. In sum, pre-K is delivering on its promise to charge up learning, to prepare children for kindergarten. This is a considerable victory in which legislators and educators should take great pride. But our work is far from done. Not all pre-K programs are equally effective, and there are many reasons to believe that pre-K can do more to power up early learning. Scientists, policymakers, and educators alike are motivated to ensure that all young children have access to pre-K settings that genuinely broaden and deepen their learning. This means supporting their ability to talk about math concepts like cardinality and measurement and to problem solve not just to count, helping them acquire a rich vocabulary and the ability to tell an organized story, not just teaching them to recite the alphabet, and building their work, their uh, capacities to work collaboratively, not just to take turns. All young children also deserve access to pre-K settings that will foster capacities to pay attention and remember and follow directions and to develop a strong motivation to learn and positive views of themselves as learners. Even with an initial strong charge, however, learning can stagnate if children's deepening knowledge and skills are not recharged when they enter elementary school. Sustaining pre-K impacts requires that we pay far more attention to what happens once children arrive at the kindergarten door. This is the newest frontier of pre-K research. Dr. Duncan is among the scientists working at this frontier, and he will share with us his efforts to identify how children's experiences in kindergarten can support and amplify the initial charge or boost that children receive from pre-K. I repeat, learning, like physical growth, is cumulative and continuous and requires ongoing nurturing. There's no point at which learning proceeds on automatic pilot. This is why we explicitly direct attention to the elementary grades in this pre-K consensus statement and conclude that, and I quote, children's early learning trajectories depend on the quality of their learning experiences, not only before and during their pre-K year, but also following the pre-K year. Classroom experiences early in elementary school can serve as charging stations for sustaining and amplifying pre-K learning gains. One good bet for powering up later learning is elementary classrooms that provide individualization and differentiation in instructional content and strategies. This statement draws attention to the challenge of keeping every child moving forward on his or her learning trajectory as she enters formal schooling. This is the fundamental task of every elementary teacher. It entails understanding each child's starting place, where he or she needs to go next and how to get her there, and how best to scaffold this forward movement for each child in a classroom. If a child has learned to count to five and discuss more and less in pre-K, she's ready to count to 10 and to learn cardinality and then to begin to problem solve and talk about her answers. If she's not helped to get from five to 10 in kindergarten, perhaps because her classmates are still learning to count to five, she will be put in what is effectively a learning dead zone. And this child's and cumulatively the nation's investment in pre-K will risk being squandered enabling all children to move forward from initial different repertoires of skill, knowledge, and behavior is extremely challenging. Early education is rocket science. This challenge is made all the more urgent by current policy discussions of pre-K education. 
In addition to school readiness, our society harbors the hope that pre-K will deliver long-lasting effects. Here, the current state of evidence leaves us with less to report. And we conclude, and I quote, convincing evidence on the longer-term impacts of scaled-up pre-K programs on academic uh, progress and academic outcomes is sparse, precluding broad conclusions. The evidence that does exist often shows that pre-K induced improvements in learning are detectable during elementary school, but studies also reveal null or negative impacts for some programs. The jury is still out. Why might this be so? My colleagues will offer their observations about this pressing and important question. In the consensus statement, we ponder how much we can draw on lessons from the existing research base on an earlier generation of programs to guide the development of today's pre-K programs. As you'll hear from Dr. Chaudhry, there is no monolithic model pre-K program, as with, was the case with the more focused, small-scale, model demonstration programs of the past. Instead, there are different pre-K delivery settings in different states with widely varying program features, teacher requirements and performance standards, target child populations, and funding levels, all of which need to be taken into account. And they have been studied with different designs and measures. The children not in pre-K are far less likely to be at home with a parent and more likely to be in some other early education program than in the past, which means that the bar that pre-K must exceed in order to be judged effective has been rising over time. It is exceedingly difficult to pull out one piece of this complex puzzle and say, aha, that explains the mixed evidence on long-term impacts. And to return to the overarching message of our statement, children enter pre-K with divergent prior early care and education and home experience, and they move for pre-K into a vast range of elementary schools across the nation. If we ignore this variability in what happens before, during, and after the pre-K year, we run the risk of missing information that can help us understand how best to design and re-engineer pre-K in specific locales to get the best results. Importantly, contradictory findings, puzzle pieces that don't fit, are precisely what propels science forward. We can draw some conclusions with confidence. We can offer good bets for next stage pre-K innovation. The jury is still out with regard to sustained impacts over time but we can agree on what we need to know and how best to generate knowledge that will deliver useful answers. This brings me to our final consensus point, which calls for ongoing innovation and evaluation to ensure continued improvement in creating and sustaining children's learning gains through research practice partnerships. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Lipsy from Vanderbilt University and Commissioner Queen here today to discuss their very important partnership in Tennessee. In closing, no one thinks we have yet devised the most effective possible pre-K program or system. We close our report with the following statement, and I quote, we have a national platform on which to build next stage increasingly effective and longer lasting pre-K programs. The hard work of refining and improving these programs so that they can fully support the intellectual and social skills the nation will need in the future has just begun. Nonetheless, the scientific rationale, the uniformly positive evidence of impact on kindergarten readiness, and the nascent body of ongoing inquiry about long-term impacts lead us to conclude that continued implementation of scaled up pre-K programs is in order as long as the impl implementation is accompanied by rigorous evaluation of impact. Thank you very much.